Hello and welcome. My name is Lauren and I'm the program director at Moses. Today, we're going to be talking you through farm ownership loans available through the Farm Service Agency. We hope that by the end of this webinar, you'll have a pretty good understanding of what loan options are available to you and how to move forward on maybe obtaining one. All right, let's begin. So the first big question is, what should you know about FSA? FSA stands for the Farm Service Agency. They run several different programs, including the Conservation Reserve Program, which is also known as CRP, and they do crop reporting, they do organic certification cost share, and they do loan programs. That's what we're going to be talking about today. FSA is often known as the Lender of First Opportunity, which basically means those people, farmers, who are having a hard time accessing commercial lenders might have an easier time accessing FSA loans. An FSA hopes to help you through your first loan, or maybe two, so that you can start building and strengthening your farm business and hopefully, eventually, qualify to access commercial lending. If you're curious or not whether or not you'd qualify for an FSA loan, we'll touch a little bit on the eligibility requirements in this webinar, but I really recommend contacting your local FSA office. You can find some information on their website, but if you contact the office, you'll be able to ask questions about your particular situation and get answers from an actual person. Along with that, you should go to the FSA website if you have some more questions about FSA's programs. On their website, they have a lot of descriptions. They also have Meet a Farmer profiles, application forms, and some pretty good information about how to get started. Again, if you want personalized information, I recommend you talk to your FSA officers. But you can learn more on their website, at least to get you started, at www.fsa.gov. So let's dig into farm ownership loans just a little bit. Farm ownership loans are basically used to add or expand your farm operation. Now, you can't use them to refinance a property you already own, but you can use them to purchase new acreage and do some work on that acreage. Um, for our purposes, we're going to mostly talk about purchasing new property or new acreage. Um, but if you have some questions about the other ways that they can be useful to you, again, it's useful to just talk to FSA and figure out exactly how you can use them and in what circumstances. Um, some of the other ways that they can be used are to construct or improve buildings and facilities, pay closing costs on a property, um, and cover some soil and water conservation opportunities. Um, basically though, we're using them primarily to help farmers and ranchers who have difficulty accessing credit, grow and improve their farm business, and usually through the acquisition of property. Now there are a couple of different types of farm ownership loans. Uh, we'll go into them a little bit more in a minute, but just so that you've had an opportunity to look at the different options, they're direct farm ownership loans, which are kind of the regular version, joint financing, which is also known as participating, and then there are down payment loans, and FSA will guarantee farm ownership loans through a commercial lender. Uh, we'll talk about that a lot more in webinar three, but for now it's good to know that that's an option if you've had a hard time accessing commercial loans up to this point. So let's talk a little bit about the eligibility requirements. Um, they break down into basically you need to have an eligible farm enterprise, you need to meet the general eligibility requirements yourself, and you need to have farm management experience. But what do those terms really mean? Let's look at them a little bit more. An eligible farm enterprise basically has to be a farm enterprise. Um, you can sort of do a quick test with yourself and just ask, am I producing egg products? Um, so for example, that might be growing a raw product that's going to be sold into the food or fiber or fuel market or be sold to other farmers. So for example, um, if you're raising livestock for sale or slaughter, 
they're probably a farm enterprise. Same with vegetables, grain crops, forage, berries, and other livestock products like dairy, wool, eggs. Um, more helpful maybe is to talk about the non-farm enterprises. So those would be things that maybe you're raising, but they're not really going into a food or fiber or fuel um, marketplace, nor are they going to other farmers or a processor. Um, and horses are often a question, I think, for people. So you can have horses on your farm, certainly, and if they're being used for farm work, then it's possible that you have a farm enterprise. So if those horses are draft horses and they're plowing for you, um, you probably have a farm enterprise and they're probably helping you raise crops that would help you distinguish that you do have a farm enterprise. But if those horses are being just boarded on your property or are for show or racing or pleasure, then you might not have a farm. Um, you might be doing this more as a hobby or for fun, and it may be a business, but it's not really a farm business. Uh, if you find yourself in a gray area and you're not quite sure whether or not you qualify as a farm, you should talk to your FSA loan officer about your situation and hopefully they'll help you figure it out. The next eligibility requirement is just sort of your general eligibility. Now, this is a pretty long list of things. It's got a lot of heavy language in it, but um, basically you can look at the FSA website for all of their language. Um, and I think if any of the things we're gonna talk through quickly bring up a red flag for you, what that most means is that you need to talk to an actual person at FSA about whether or not you're eligible. But for many of us, uh, reading through this quick list will help us know that yes, we are indeed eligible or maybe we need to ask some more questions. So if you have uh, controlled substance issues or convictions, um, I guess I should say legal issues or convictions, um, that'll be a, a red flag you wanna talk to someone about. Um, but generally, if you don't have any federal or state convictions related to controlled substances, you're probably okay. Also, legal ability to accept the responsibility for loan obligation. That means that you are an adult and generally able to accept legal responsibility. Again, if you have questions, talk to someone at FSA. The next one's a little bit different, acceptable credit history. FSA doesn't use credit scores um, in particular to determine your eligibility, but they are going to want to know about your repayment history. So if you've had issues in the past with repaying loans, you're going to want to be ready to explain those concerns to your FSA loan officer. And if you feel that your repayment history is particularly bad, you might want to question whether or not you're um, ready to be eligible. Um, again, the FSA staff are really great in talking these things through, so if you find yourself in a gray area, talk to them. Um, the rest of them we'll just kind of talk through quickly. Uh, you want to be a U.S. citizen, non-citizen national, or legal resident. There's some language with FSA about people who live in certain territories. Uh, I would talk to them if you're in a territory. You don't want to have any previous debt forgiveness issues with the agency, and that would include a guaranteed loan. Also, you want to make sure that you weren't able to obtain sufficient credit elsewhere. Um, what that means is that you've contacted a commercial lender of some sort or a private lender um, and you haven't been able to access credit through them. You'll want to try one or two commercial lenders before you contact FSA. You'll want to also make sure that you don't have delinquent federal debts that you haven't had any issues with federal crop insurance violations. And I think most importantly, at the end of this process, you're going to be the owner operator of a family farm. So that means if you are buying property for a large corporation um, with lots of different partners, FSA probably isn't the right fit for you. But if you are looking at running a family scale farm at the end of this loan closing and the property will be owned by you and managed by you, then you're in really great shape. Hopefully this is a pretty good overview of what you need to do personally to be generally 
eligible, but again, questions are best directed at FSA officers who can talk you through it a little bit more in terms of your particular situation. The other big thing is that you need to have experience requirements. Um, different FSA loans have different levels of requirements. So a uh, farm operating loan is going to require that you're able to operate the farm, but a farm ownership loan is going to have some heavier requirements, mostly because they know that they're giving you a, a pretty important and generally expensive um, opportunity here and they want to make sure that you'll be able to repay that opportunity. So be ready to show that you have the experience you need to operate the farm and eventually repay the loan. And that eligibility can be uh, shown through education, through on-the-job training, or experience on farms, maybe a combination of the three. But most importantly, you'll want to make sure that you've participated in the business and decision making of someone's farm, whether it's your own or someone else's, at least three of the last 10 years. That will really help you show that you are ready for this loan. So let's start looking at the loans themselves. We're not going to go too in depth on each one, but I want to give you a, a good sense, at least broadly, of what the differences are. So a direct farm ownership loan is made available and is managed through FSA. You'll go to FSA to apply for the loan and the money will come through their budget with the USDA. You'll need to meet all of those eligibility requirements, but there aren't any additional requirements um, beyond what we've already talked about. The maximum loan is $300,000 right now. Um, and that gets adjusted every so often because of inflation. The interest rates are going to vary um, pretty much on a monthly basis. And so you'll want to go to the Farm Service Agency website and look at their posted loan rates. And what they'll do is um, look at the interest rate that was posted at the date of your loan approval and the one that was posted at the date of your loan closing. Whichever one was lower, that will be your fixed rate for the loan. So you'll, like I said, go to their website and sort of see where it's at right now. Because it changes, I didn't want to post it into this webinar, but hopefully you have an easy time accessing that. The other thing worth noting is that the repayment terms are typically 40 years or less. Um, Again, it will depend a little bit on the farm that you're purchasing and your exact circumstances, but you can generally expect something um, under 40 years. The next loan type that we're going to talk about is the joint financing loan, which is also known as a participating loan. This one is a little bit more complicated because it actually includes an outside lender. Again, the eligibility requirements are going to be the same as what we've already talked about. Um, nothing new or surprising there, but the structure is set up quite different. So FSA will lend up to 50% of what they call either the cost or value of the property being purchased. So that will either be its assessed value or the cost that you're purchasing it at. Um, the details of that are best discussed with an FSA loan officer, but um, hopefully those two numbers, the cost and the value, are pretty close to one another. The rest of the balance will then be provided by another lender. So I will refer to them as a commercial lender, but it could also be um, another state program or a private lender. Um, it could be a credit union or a bank. Um, there are quite a few different options, but the important thing to know is that FSA will be offering up to 50%. Um, you could set it up so that FSA was covering 45% and the remaining balance was covered by a commercial lender of some sort, um, but it has to be no more than 50. The loan limitation on this, again, is $300,000, and that is subject to change over time, but, but at the time of this webinar it was $300,000. The interest rate, again, is set up the same way that it was for the regular farm ownership loan. 
So you'll look at the date of um, your loan approval and the date of your loan closing. Whichever posted interest rate was lower should be your fixed rate. And again, the repayment terms, we're looking at a maximum repayment period of 40 years. Now we're on to the most complicated of the three loans. Um, this one is called the Down Payment Farm Ownership Loan. Now when you look at the eligibility requirements on the slide, I bet you've already noticed that there are some additional requirements beyond what we've already talked about. So let's look at those really quickly. The additional requirements um, start with cannot own a farm or ranch more than 30% of the average size farm at the time of application. That means that they're going to look at the Census of Agriculture data, the most current one, and they're going to look at what the average size farm is. If your farm is more than 30% of that number at the time of application, you're not going to be able to access this loan. But if it's 30% or less, you're still in good shape. The other interesting thing to look at here is that you need to be either a beginning farmer rancher, which means um, you're within your first 10 years of farming, or you need to be a woman or minority farmer or rancher, which is generally talked about as underserved farmers. Now, you don't have to be both a beginner and a woman or minority but you need to be one or the other. So you could be a minority farmer or rancher that isn't a beginner and still have access. You could be a woman farmer or rancher that's not a beginner and still have access. Or you could be within your first 10 years of farming but not identify as a woman or minority. Any of those combinations will work. But that about sums up the eligibility requirements that are a little bit different about the down payment farm ownership loan. Now again, the interest rate, you're going to look at that website. It's going to be set up the same way, the lower of either loan approval or closing posted rate. But the repayment terms are just a little bit different. FSA's portion of the repayment period um, can't be more than 20 years. Now there's also a non-FSA portion of the repayment, um, and that has to be at least 30 years. So this is set up a little bit strange um, in that one is a maximum and one is a minimum. But hopefully that makes sense to you looking at the slide or you can at least jot it down. The other part is that there are no balloon payments allowed within the first 20 years of the non-FSA portion. And a balloon payment basically means a really large chunk of cash all being paid at one time. Instead, they're looking for spread out payments of smaller amounts throughout those first 20 years. After the 20 years, that requirement is lifted. You might be saying, what's this whole non-FSA portion? Um, so let's talk about that for a minute. The structure of these down payment farm ownership loans are very different than the other structures. FSA is only providing partial financing, which is kind of similar to the participation loan. Um, but the difference here is that the loan applicant, um, that would be you if you're applying for one of these loans, is actually required to provide 5% of the purchase price of that farmer ranch. Um, and then beyond that, all the financing by the creditors has to equal the other 95% or less. So. Um, we'll talk about how that gets split up here. The FSA loan maximum is calculated as this um, sort of complicated thing, but we can make it a little bit simpler. Um, the complicated way is 45% of the purchase price, 45% of the appraised value, or the property's total purchase or appraised value cannot exceed 667000 $667,000, sorry, I looked at my number and got a little confused there. Um, and so the 45% of that would equal that $300,000 limit. So um, basically, you're looking at the purchase price or the appraised value and having to stay under that $300,000 limit for FSA's portion, um, they will pay up to 45% of the lower of either the purchase or the appraised. 
The rest of the balance can then be financed through the commercial lender, um, again, a cooperative, a private lender, um, whoever you might be able to finance through. And if you're having a hard time finding that additional financing, it's possible that FSA would guarantee the other portion of the loan. Um, it, there are some kind of restrictions behind that or some hoops to jump through, so you'd want to work closely with your FSA loan officer, but it is an opportunity if you need it. So having confused you thoroughly, let's look at that a little bit more simply. Um, to break it down, 5% of that price is going to be provided by you, the loan applicant. And then up to 45%, so 45% or less, is provided by FSA. And then the remaining amount, so 50% plus um, minus whatever that 5% is that you're paying, <laughs> um, you can't cover that part, but 50% um, plus is then provided by an additional lender and that's your remaining balance. Hopefully that made a little bit of sense. Now as you look at the forms that are required to apply for these loans, it, it looks like a kind of daunting list. And we do have some other webinars here and a book that will support you in figuring out some of these pieces of information um, like your business plan worksheet and balance sheet. Um, but also, my experience is that FSA staff are pretty good at helping you through this list of things. However, I put the list up partially so that you can see the forms that you will need to look at and their instructions, but also to help you think about the length of time that it might take to actually apply for this loan. And then, beyond applying for them, you'll also need to get approved and the site will have to be appraised or, or reviewed and then you'll actually have to get through the loan approval and the release of funds, which is also known as the award. All of that can take a little bit of time, so it's important as you step into this process that you are prepared for the length of time this might take and know that you've looked at your other options and this seems to be the right one for you. Also, I mention all of these application um, pieces, all these forms, because if you are also applying for a direct farm ownership loan, or uh, a direct operating loan, at the same time you're doing your direct farm ownership loan, you can include both loan applications on one set of forms because they require the same forms. So if you are hoping to purchase a farm and maybe add some capital needs to that, let's say a different tractor or um, some breeding livestock, you could potentially apply for both loans with one set of paperwork, and that can make your life a lot easier. So think about what um, your farm is going to need in order to be successful, and talk with your FSA loan officer about how you can best get that um, supported through the FSA. Now one more thing to think about here is that um, you might not know who your local FSA agent is, um, who to talk to. So I've posted here the website to the USDA Farm Service Agency. Um, and if you go to their programs and services and then farm loan programs and farm ownership loans, you'll find a whole lot of information beyond what I've just shared with you on these loans. Also, if you look at the photo here of the web page, you can click on that button, State Offices, on the top ribbon, and you can use that to navigate to your local county and find out who you should be talking to about these loans and other opportunities with FSA, whether it's that organic cost share or crop reporting or CRP, um, or just to find out a little bit more about all of the programs they do offer. I can't say enough about our local office, and I hope that your local office treats you just as well. Um, and hopefully giving a call in after you've watched these webinars and maybe gone through a couple of the worksheets will help you feel like you understand what you're asking for and you're asking the questions you need to be asking in order to get your farm up and running. So good luck and happy farming.